الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. So we pick up in the fun stuff in the صفة الصلاة يعني uh, we, we finished the first sujood and the sitting between the two sujood and then performing the second sujood يعني يسجد الثانية كالأولى The Muallif says in the Matan in Zad al-Mustakniع that you make the second sujood like you did the first طيب ثم يرفع مكبرا then you set up from the sujood with takbir طيب now remember the difference between رفع اليدين and a takbir takbir is to say Allahu Akbar رفع is to raise the hand. Two different things. For example, when you're beginning the salah, when you're beginning the salah, the first takbir, the first saying of Allahu Akbar, what is the hukam on it? With the rukun, min arkanu salah, and one of the pillars of the salah. What about raising the hands in the first takbir? Sunnah, mustahab, and it's not wajib, and it's not a rukun. Tayyib. When you are going into Rukua, after finishing Surah Al-Fatiha and another Surah and all of that, when you're going into Rukua, what do you say? Allahu Akbar. You say Takbir. What is the hukam on that? Wajib. Not from the Arkan, Wajib. And we'll explain this when we get to the bab of the Farq, yani the difference between Arkan, Wajibat of Salah and Adilla and so on. But here it's Wajib. And raising of the hands? Sunnah. Mustahab. Tayyib. When you're getting up from Rukua, what will you say? Sami Allahu liman hamida. You will not say Allahu Akbar. But you will raise the hands. Here there is no takbir, but there is raf al yadain. When you're going into sujood, you will say takbir, but no raf al yadain. So raf al yadain and the saying of takbir are not always connected. And the hukam is different on different takbirat. And on the Rafa al-Yadain, it's always Sunnah, except for the places where it's not narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then you cannot make it there because it's not Sabitun and Nabi Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you're going into sujood, or you're getting up from sujood, or you're going into the second sajda, or you're getting up from it, there are takbirat for all of them. All of them are wajib. Tayyib. But you don't do Rafa al-Yadain with any of them. Tayyib. Then we get into an issue where how do you get up for the second rak'ah? And they're going to be, basically we're going to discuss two issues today. But these two issues, these two masail uh, are, they took me longer to research than probably some of the other whole abwab did. Because they're, they're hotly contested and really fun. I mean, really interesting. But uh, yani something where there's a lot of research and it's not like a clear mas'ala. So here the Mu'allif says ala sudur qadmayhi yani on the tips of the or, or the what we call the ball of the foot right which is yani the front of your foot okay I would raise my foot to show it but that would kind of be awkward so you know if let's imagine this is your foot the front part of it right meaning you get up without sitting this is in the matan here and here we have a place where there is some khilaf of ulema about al-jalsa, which is jalsa to istaraha Istaraha to rest. Okay? This is, there is a sitting here called the sitting of resting. The zahir of the matan here is you don't sit for it. Okay? But there is khilaf of ulema. No doubt, jamhur al-ulema. The majority of the ulema did not take it to be sunnah or mustahab to sit. None of the ulema that I could find from the well-known ulema of Islam, wallahu alam if there is somebody that I didn't read from, none of them took it to be wajib. And so this is the first thing I want to clarify. Why? Because I was in another country, Pakistan, and I used to pray with uh, some of the brothers who I saw as the best of the brothers there, mashallah, who were called Ahlul Hadith, and the people of Hadith. And I saw them, mashallah, sticking to the good aqidah and, and very good in fiqh. 
But in some masail, I mean, they were very متشدد يعني. <laughs> and this is one of them. The jalsa to istiraha, they were like, to them, and even if they didn't say it's wajib, they acted like it. And I used to lead salah in some of their masail. Sometimes I wasn't like an imam there or anything, but I would go and they knew me and they knew some of my shuyukh and stuff, so they would tell me lead the salah. And I would on purpose not sit for him. <laughs> and it just to show it's not wajib at least. Right? Sometimes I would, sometimes I would skip it. And the times I would skip it, oh man, it was like they were waiting for me to finish the salah to jump. Why didn't you sit for it? Why is it wajib? There is hadith on it. There is hadith on it. What about the hadith again? So, so I tried to educate them and they were very rough with it. So this is the first thing I want to clarify. It's not wajib. It's not obligatory. There is no amr here. Rasulullah didn't order it. So don't go to an extreme for it. On the other hand, some of the uh, other masajid I went there, which I usually didn't lead salah because they didn't really like me all that much. Um, but they, they would never sit for it. And if I led salah there, I would, and you know, if I sometime came late or something and made a second jama'ah, first they were mad about me making a second jama'ah. <laughs> um, but secondly, uh, I would sit for it, right? just to educate people that this is also from the sunnah. So, so this is the first thing, don't go to an extreme with these issues. Okay? This is not wujub, this is not something that either way will make your salah batila or will, will, will like, yani, affect your salah. This is things about what is mustahab, what is sunnah. Right? These are not things of arkan and wujub. There is no like fadila for it that you will miss if you don't do it. Like Rafa Ladain, we mentioned about the 10 rewards and so on. Like it's not like that type of issue. It doesn't have clear adilla like Rafa Ladain uh, and so on. So what is the opinion of the ulema? Jamhur al-ulema including al Hanafiya. And I looked at many of the books of the Hanafiya uh, across the board. They did not take it to be sunnah. Okay. And the Malikiya. Even though I found some very few Maliki ulema that did accept it, but the Jamhur, the majority of the Maliki ulema and their madhab and the Mu'tamid, the Muftahbi, the one that the fatwa is given upon the Maliki madhab, that you do not sit for Jalsatul Istirah. And there are some Shawafi', although a minority, who thought this was not Sunnah. And this is uh, the opinion of the uh, uh, you would, I would say the Mu'tamad opinion of the Hanabila, that it is not Sunnah. Tayyip. The second opinion is that it is Sunnah to sit. When you're getting up for the second or fourth raka'ah. Right? Because if you're getting up for a third raka'ah, then you're going to have tashahud anyway. Then you don't have this issue. First raka'ah, I mean, you, 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 I mean, when you finish the first raka'ah, you're getting up for the second, right? If you're getting up for the third, it's not an issue. If you're getting up for the fourth. So there's two times in a salah that has four raka'at that this would be an issue, which is getting up for the second and fourth. If you're making raka'atain, then it'll only come up once, which is when you're getting up for the second. Tayyib. So the... Mu'tamad, what I found to be the reliable opinion of the Shafi'i Madhab, even though I did mention there are some who didn't agree with this view, but the majority of the Shafi'i, they said, the Shafi'i, that they said it is Sunnah to sit for Jalsatul Istiraha before getting up for the second or fourth rak'ah. And this is the opinion of some of the Hanabila. Some of the Hanabila took this view, and some Malikiya, but rare. Amongst the Hanabila, there are many, and this is something, if you look in Al-Insaf, you will find uh, Al-Mardawi and others, they mention the Hanabila that took this view and so on. But there is a third view. The third view, which is the view of uh, Ibn Qudama Al-Maqdasi, the great uh, scholar, Hanbali scholar. Abu Ya'la, Qadi Abu Ya'la, also from the Hanabila. And this is the opinion of uh, Ibn Al-Qayyim, and uh, Abdurrahman Nasir al-Sa'di, and al Shaykhuna Muhammad ibn Salih ibn Uthaymeen, and Ibn Rajab gave isharat towards it, and he pointed towards it, and Shaykh Abdullah ibn Aqil, uh, this is their view, a third view, which is the third view is that you can sit for the Jalsa al-Istarah in the Haja, if there is a need for it. What does that mean? Maybe you're making a, a, a very wrong salah, mashallah, 
and you made a very long sujood, and as you're getting up, you don't want to get up right on the balls of the feet. You, you may want to sit a minute, relax, istiraha, rest, and then get up. Okay? Or somebody may have pain, like somebody may be injured, somebody may be older, some, somebody may be yani, heavier, somebody may have some other health issues, or somebody just may be tired that day or whatever. So in the haja, if there is a need for it, you can sit for it, and there is no need for it, you can get up straight. This is a third view. And this, as I said, is the opinion of many of the Hanabal, including some of the major Hanabal like Ibn Qudama and Ibn Al-Qayyim. And this is the opinion of Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen. And this is the opinion I take. This is the opinion I find closest to what is correct. That occasionally if you sit for it, Alhamdulillah, nothing wrong with it. Occasionally if you don't sit for it, nothing wrong with it. If you need to sit for it, sit for it. If you don't want to sit for it, no problem with it. Because of the Adilla. So now I will discuss the Adilla briefly. I, I could literally write a Risala on this uh, easily. I mean, even today I spent all day just reviewing <laughs> all the notes from my different books today. And, and this is something that I spent months and months of research just on this Mas'ala. I'm not going to go deep, otherwise it would take way too much time. But I will briefly discuss the evidences. Those who took it to be Sunnah, they mentioned the hadith from uh, Malik ibn Huwayrith radiyallahu anhu from Rasulullah sallam and this hadith is actually in Al-Bukhari regarding Witr salah. This is about Witr. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was getting up, when he finished the first rak'ah, he sat and then he got up. See, I'm, I'm going to summarize from the hadith here. But there is another hadith from Abu Hamid which is a famous Sahabi who explained the Salah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi to 10 other Sahaba and in that Hadith. And this Hadith is an authentic Hadith, the riwayat that I saw in Ibn Majah, even though Shaykh Albani يعني, criticized it in some of the Asanid and so on, but the one I found in Ibn Majah is a reliable narration. This also mentions the Jalsa al istiraha so this is also mentioned the sitting. I did not find many narrations from the Sahaba, but I found these from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On the other hand, there are some ahadith marfu'an, yani from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about getting up on the sudur uh, qadmehi, yani on the, on the ends of the toes, but the ones that are from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are all da'if. But there are narrations as Ibn Mundir has mentioned for Ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah Ibn Umar and Abdullah Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma and many imma and ulama including Al-Bayhaqi and others they authenticated them. And they are in the Musanif Ibn Abi Shayba and the Sunan Al-Kabir of Al-Bayhaqi and I looked at them this morning as well. So there are those but those are mawquf, yani those are from the Sahaba and there is kalam on the Asanid as well. Yani there is discussion on the authenticity of the Asanid. But now it comes to be, the, so when you look at it just from here, and some of our brothers, especially from the, mashallah, brothers who uh, and you have only studied hadith and not really studied fiqh and things, when they look at it from this, well, you have a rawaya, at least the one from uh, Malik ibn Hayrat from Bukhari. So no doubt Sanadan is the strongest. And you have all these other rawayat, but they all have some da'af in them and some discussion, even if some are acceptable, no doubt they will not meet the level of the hadith of al-Bukhari. So they look at it like, okay, Hadith al-Bukhari, khalas, this is good. Everything else, khalas, out. Ikhwan, take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, he brings up an excellent point about this issue. He says, and Ibn al-Qayyim did before him. It's not something new. And Ibn Qadama did uh, before them. What is the issue they bring up? There are hundreds of ahadith that describe the salah of, the salah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and out of them, we find only these two sarihan clearly mentioning this. The rest of them, they do mention the sujood and getting up from the sujood straight without discussing whether there was on the sudur al qadamehi or bi jalsa to istiraha. But when you mention Rasulullah made sujood and gara mukabbiran, yani the, the istidlal from that is he got up straight. Right? When you mention sujood and you mention getting up, then istidlalan, those are for straight, just getting straight up. Right? So those adilla, even though they're not sarih, they're not explicit, so you can't use either way, but they do come as a factor right, into play. If the jalsa to istarah was something that Rasulullah did regularly, then no doubt 
in those ahadith, they would also have to be mentioned. And the interesting thing about the narrators who mention Jalsa to Staraha, they are both yani, from the later Sahaba. Malik ibn Hayrat, for example, he became Muslim around the 9th or 10th Hijri, towards the end of the life of the Prophet And those that mention the Salah of Rasulullah from the very young Sahaba and so on, even though there is da'af in those Asanid, but they were Muslim earlier, that they mentioned the, the ala sudur qadmayhi. Right? So from this, some of the a'imma and ulema, like Ibn al-Qayyim and like Shaykh ibn al-Thaymeen and Shaykh Abdullah ibn Aqil and others, they said that what this points towards is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did this at a later time in his life. And it could have been due to yani, being older of age. I know before, I know people watching the video are ready to jump on this. I know, relax, relax. I will get to your point. Tayyip. But the response to that, as Ibn Hajar mentions as well, like I said, I've researched this in and out. Don't, don't think I haven't read what you're, what you're in your mind. You're like, I've heard. I know you read Shifat Sata Nabi. Great. That's not the only book in the world. Tayyip. Uh, Ibn Hajar says that we do not know of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lacking anything in his salah or doing anything different due to old age. Tell you, and that is correct. But there is a riwayah, and this is in the uh, Sunan of Abu Dawood, and it's a Sahih riwayah. It's an authentic riwayah. Uh, as Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen and before him ibn al-Qayyim and before him ibn Qudama have mentioned regarding this mas'ala where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it's a longer riwayah, I'll mention this what's relevant so sahih, I checked the sanad this morning just to make sure where he told the sahaba that don't compete with me don't be in a rush with me when I'm in salah because when I go into ruku' you will catch the ruku' but when I'm getting up you may get up before me because I have gained weight yani I have gained from yani, uh, the bulk from before so I get up, meaning is that I get up slower than I used to. So don't, don't be competing with me because then you might get up and it's still before me. But what does this show that Rasulullah did towards the later of his age have some differences in his salah due to age and weight and things like this? I mean, he died at 63. So when a person gets into their 60s and he was, and in the end, a human being. And in fact, as we know from the Sahih Hadith that in Tabuk, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during that battle time, he had hurt his hip and he even prayed sitting down. And that is around the time that Malik ibn Hirat, for example, became Muslim. So again, if you are injured, for example, even if you've healed from that injury, you may not be making salah in the way you were before. Okay? So a lot of, now this Hadith shows that there is... Uh, in the later time of the, the life of Rasulullah sallallahu there could have been some differences in the salah. Another point that's brought up by Ibn al-Qayyim is that if you look at the mawquf ahadith, yani the af'al of sahaba, we don't find the jalsa sustarah as, as we do getting up on the sudur qadmayhi. So putting all this together, we do have sahih ahadith, no doubt to it, that Rasulullah did sit for jalsa sustarah. But, we also have narrations, some of them acceptable, some of them weak, at least from the Sahaba to get up on the Sudur Qadmayhi. And we have other ahadith that mention the Sifa of Salah, mention getting up from Sujood without the Jalsa Tistara, so Istidlalan, they're also Adilla. So when you put all of this together, the strongest view is the third view. And that is the view of our Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, and of Ibn Qudama al-Maqdasi and Naqadi Abu Ya'la and Ibn al-Qayyim and Abdurrahman Nasir al-Sa'di and uh, in istidlalan from some of the aqwal of Ibn Rajab and Sheikh Abdullah Ibn Aqil and يعني, this is the view I hold that if you sit for Jalsa to Istarah nothing wrong with it and if you sit occasionally even without the need just to teach people that it is from the Sunnah nothing wrong with it and if you skip it occasionally يعني, nothing wrong with it and if you don't have a need and you get up straight, nothing wrong with it. And if you feel a little tired or if you're feeling yani, like you need to sit for a minute, nothing wrong with it. None of that is an issue. Tayyib. Now a question gets to be, and this is a question I deal with regularly in my own, I, I mean, I deal with this mas'ala, is if you're leading salah and the people behind you are not used to the jalsa. Then it's, then sometimes when you say Allahu Akbar and you sit for the jalsa, they all get up. 
And now what you have done is you have yani, made a situation where they're competing or getting up before the imam, which is something that is man'an. So if you're going to lead salah in a masjid that the people regularly do not, then I do not suggest you do it unless you educate them. Because to get up before the imam would be wrong. And if they don't know that you're going to sit for the jalsa, and they're not used to it, then no doubt when they hear the takbir, they're going to get up. Right? So you need to have that hikmah. And if you're praying behind an imam, and just Shaykh Ibn Al-Thaymin will ask this question. It's not my fatwa, I don't give fatwa, I just quote from the ulema. Shaykh Ibn Al-Thaymin was asked that if I take it to be sunnah, again remember it's not wajib. If I take it to be sunnah, right, as many of our shayukh have, and the imam I'm praying behind doesn't. Right? Meaning he gets up. Right? So should I still sit? Is this from the sunan that you can go mukhtalif al-imam? Yani you can be different from the imam. For example, as we mentioned earlier, as it's in the matan, and as Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin and others mentioned, if the imam doesn't say ameen out loud in a loud salah, what should you do? In a loud salah. Say it out loud. Right? Because it's from the sunnah. It's established, thabithun. And not saying is not established, right? If the Imam doesn't make Raful Adain and going into Ruku and getting up, what should you do? Make Raful Adain. This is from the Sunnah. This is not from the things that you have to like, and if the Imam leaves the Sunnah, you have to leave it. La. But here when the Imam gets up, should you sit? La. You should get up with the Imam. Even if you take it to be Sunnah, because here you are now Mukhtalif with Tartibu Salah. And you're changing not something that is an individual action. Now you're changing the tiba of the Imam. And if you take it not to be the sunnah, the imam sits, what should you do? Sit. Here, this is the following of the imam. Because there is a hadith about the actions that you do following. And one of them, when he gets up, you get up. When he sits, you sit. This is uh, something I could spend a lot of time on, but we're going to stop here, inshallah. If you think this was a lot of time, it really wasn't, right? Tayyib. Then you pray the second... Raka'a, as you prayed يعني, the first. Right? What, is, what does that mean? يعني, you recite Al-Fatiha, and then you recite a surah after Al-Fatiha. But as the Mu'allif here says, that you do not recite the Dua Al-Istiftah, nor do you seek refuge with Allah. You don't say, A'udhu Billahi Samuel Alim Minash Shaitan Rajeem. And you do not need to يعني, renew the niyyah. So these three things you do different. In the first rak'ah, when you're beginning the first rak'ah, you make a niyyah. You don't have to make it with words, you don't have to make it with the script, but you, in your heart you make a niyyah, right? In the second, now you already have the niyyah. Khalas, yani you have the niyyah in the heart, you're good. You don't need to renew it. As some, yani shad, aqwal from alema mention it, but this is wrong. Secondly, you have said, a'udhu billahi samiyul alim, and if you look at the adilla presented for it, they are for the beginning of salah, not for every rak'ah. Even though like Shabafi, they took a different view on this issue. But what is clear for adilla is you do not say, A'udhu Billahi Samiyu Al-Alim Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim again. You only say that in the first rak'ah. And you do not recite the dua, the opening dua, dua al-istiftah, right? Which you, you did that in the opening. That is only for the first rak'ah. What you do do is you say, Bismillah, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Al Basmala. And whether it's a loud or silent salah, do you say it out loud or silently? Silently. From the Sunnah to say it silently. I know the Madhab al Shafi'i is to say it out loud. We discussed it already with the Adilla. But what is Rajih? You say it silently. So in the first rak'ah, you said it silently. In the second rak'ah, you will say it. So you begin your second rak'ah with what? The Basmala. Not a tasmiyah, not just Bismillah, but Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And then if it's a loud salah, you start the loud recitation with Al-Fatiha. In the second rak'ah, we're not talking about the third and fourth here, talking about the second, you will recite Al-Fatiha, then you will say Ameen in the loud salawat out loud, and then you will read a second surah, and then you will go into ruku' and get up from ruku' as you did, and so on. Then you sit for a tashahud. Khalas, we'll, we'll, we'll end here because the shahud is going to have the interesting thing about the ishara and we're going to save that for the next dars, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair.